the event of death and the time after death. We live in a time when we are reminded daily, hourly of death, of people passing through the gate of death, of this momentous human life event. Death becomes a life event for people, in the true sense of the word, only through spiritual science, which shows us how the eternal forces that go through births and deaths are working internally within us. These forces create a particular form for us during the time between birth and death that enables us to take on a different form of existence after passing through the gate of death. Thus, death, which from the materialistic viewpoint can be only an abstract end of life, becomes through spiritual science a real event, even if a difficult one, for our whole life. Dear friends, among us have passed through the gate of death primarily as a result of current historic events. Let me read that again. Dear friends among us have passed through the gate of death primarily as a result of current historic events, but also from other causes beyond those. So, perhaps it seems especially fitting in our reflections today to give some thought, precisely at this time, to the death event and the facts of human life that follow after death. Certainly, examinations of the life between death and rebirth have come up again and again in our spiritual scientific reflections, and we have already gathered much evidence of this matter specifically. You well know from spiritual science's course to this point, that everything can be presented from only one particular point of view at a time, and that, basically, we can come to know things more specifically only by having them illuminated from different points of view. Thus, I will add a few things today to what we already know of the suggested subject that may be useful to us for our total worldview. We observe people in a spiritual scientific way, and this is good, standing before us in the physical world as expressions of their total being. We must first of all begin with what human beings present in the physical world. That is why I have called attention again and again to how we can gain something like a guiding overview, as it were, of the total person, if we first take the physical body as our basis, which we come to know from the exterior through sensory observation, through scientific analysis of sensory observation here in the physical world. We then take as our basis the formative body, which we characterize as the etheric body. This already has a suprasensory character and cannot be observed with our ordinary sense organs, not even with the intellect connected with the brain, and is thus already inaccessible to ordinary science. We can say, however, that this etheric body is a construct that was known by Emanuel Hermann Fichte, the son of the great Johann Gottlieb Fichte, as well as Troxler and others. This etheric body is something in humans that can really be grasped only by imaginative perception, because it is suprasensory. It can, however, be seen outwardly with suprasensory perception, just as the sensory physical body can be seen outwardly with sensory perception. Now, we go further in our observation to the astral body. The astral body is not something that can be seen with the outer senses as the physical body can, nor with the inner senses as the etheric body can. Rather, the astral body is something that can only be experienced inwardly. We must be inside it ourselves in order to experience it. Just as with the fourth aspect, that we must first of all grasp here in the physical world, the capital I. We build the whole human being out of these four members of human nature. We also know, from our observations up to now, that what we actually call the human physical body is something very complex. This human physical body was developed over a long period, through the Saturn, Sun and Moon stages of evolution, and has already played a part in earthly evolution from the very beginning of earth existence until our time. Our bodies have built up a complex history. The physical world really shows only its exterior to us, also to ordinary science. 
One could say that through ordinary physical seeing and physical science, we know only as much about the physical body as a person knows about a building by going around it outside and never going inside, never finding out what is inside the building or or who lives there. Now, of course, those who take their stance from outer science in the materialistic sense will say they know the inner nature of the physical body very well. They will say that they know this inner aspect because they have looked at the brain within the septum, because they have looked at the stomach and the heart during dissections, and so they know it. But the inner aspect that can be seen externally in this way, the spatial inner aspect, is not what is meant here when we speak of the inner. This spatial inner aspect is also only an external thing. This spatial inner aspect in the human body is actually much more external than the true spatial inner aspect. It certainly sounds strange when I say this, but you know from previous descriptions from spiritual science that our sense organs, which we carry on the exterior of our body, on the spatial exterior, were developed already during the Saturn period. They are made of forces much more spiritual than are, for example, our stomach or other organs that are internal in a spatial sense. Internal organs are made of the least spiritual forces. As strange as this sounds, this fact must nevertheless be pointed out. People speak about themselves incorrectly. This is natural because of living here on the physical plane, but indeed what they express is incorrect. We actually should call the skin on our face the internal and the stomach the external aspect. We would come much closer to reality that way. We would come closer to reality if we said that we eat from inside to outside. We send food from inside to outside by sending it to the stomach. Then if we said, as we do now, from outside to inside, because the closer to the surface our organs lie, the more the spiritual forces touch them, and the less the spiritual forces touch them, the further into our spatial inner aspect they lie. You can see this easily if you recall what has been brought up in the descriptions from spiritual science up to now. You will know that during the moon stage of evolution, and again during the earth stage, something split off, and then went out into space from the Saturn, Sun, and Moon stages of evolutions. Something strange happened during this splitting off. We were turned, really, turned like a glove is turned, inside out, the internal to the outside and the external to the inside. The human face, which is turned outward today, was really turned inward during the Saturn and Sun periods, in its very first beginning, of course, and also during a part of the Moon period. Organs that are internal today were formed from outside, during our moon existence. Since that time we have really been turned inside out like a skirt. A while back, turning a skirt inside out was commonly done so that clothes could be worn for a longer time. Of course, this is not customary today. When we speak of the physical body, we must also be aware that there is much that is suprasensory about it. Its whole method of construction is suprasensory. It is built from the suprasensory and turns its outer aspect to us only when we see it as a whole. Now we come to the etheric body, which is no longer visible at all to physical sensory observation. The etheric body is very important when human beings have gone through the gate of death. Initially, in the first days, after we enter the spiritual world, this etheric body is of especially great importance. We must learn to think differently in relation to the physical body, really learn to think differently if we want to contemplate correctly what is waiting for us after we pass through the gate of death. Indeed, you know, because it can be observed even from the physical world, that we cast off our physical body when we pass through the gate of death. The physical body is given over to the earthly element through decomposition or burning. The two processes differ only in length of time. Now it could seem for the person who has passed through the gate of death as if the physical body, as such, were simply disposed of, but that is not the case. We can give over to the earth only the part of the physical body that comes from the earth itself. 
we cannot give over the part of the physical body that originated from old moon existence, from old sun existence, from old Saturn existence. What originated from old Saturn existence, from sun existence, from moon existence, and and indeed even from a large part of earth existence, are supra-sensory forces. And these supra-sensory forces in our physical body, which show us only their exterior in sensory seeing, as I have just described, what happens to these supra-sensory forces when we have passed through the gate of death? Only what was given to our physical body, to this most wondrous structure that exists first of all as structure in the world, only what is given to it by the earth is given back to the earth. What happens to the rest then when we pass through the gate of death? The rest pulls away from what sinks into the earth through decomposition or combustion and is taken up into the whole cosmos. When you think of all that you can sense in the environment surrounding the earth, with all the planets and fixed stars, and when you think of this process as spiritually as possible, then in this spiritual thinking you will have the place in us where our spiritual essence is. But only a part of this spiritual aspect, that which lives in warmth, is separated and remains with the earth. Warmth, our inner warmth, our own warmth is separated, remains with the earth. But all the rest of the physical body, that is spiritual, is carried out into the whole of space, into the entire cosmos. When we now leave the physical body, where do we go? What are we submerged in? Upon our death, we are submerged quickly, lightning fast into what formed the physical body from all of the suprasensory forces. You could imagine that all of the creative forces that have worked on your physical body since the Saturn period expand out into the infinite and prepare the place where you live between death and rebirth. All of that had been simply concentrated in the space enclosed by our skin between birth and death. We are now outside of the physical body, and we have an experience that is important, above all, for the entire life between death and rebirth that follows. I have already mentioned this often. This experience is of an opposite nature to the corresponding experience in life on the physical plane. Here, in life on the physical plane, we cannot look back to the hour of our birth with ordinary sensory perception. None of us can remember or look back on our own birth in this way. None of us has an actual experience of our own birth. We know only that we were born, first because perhaps someone told us, and second because we know that all the people who have come to the earth after us were also born. It is exactly the opposite with the corresponding experience after death. Whereas the vision of our own birth does not stand before our soul in physical life, the moment of death, if we look at it spiritually, stands before our soul during the whole life between death and rebirth. However, we must be clear that this moment of death is seen from the other side of the threshold. If death has something frightening about it, it is only because it is seen here as an extinguishing, so to speak, an end. From the other side, from the spiritual perspective, when we look back to the moment of death, death appears evermore as the triumph of the spirit, the resting free of the spirit from the physical body. It appears as the greatest, most splendid, most meaningful event. And our eye consciousness after death awakens from this event. For the entire period between death and rebirth, we have an I consciousness that is not just similar to, but actually a much higher sense than the one we have here in physical life. We would not have this I consciousness if we could not look back and see, but from the other side, from the spiritual perspective, this moment in which we struggled out of the physical aspect with our spiritual aspect. We know that we are an I only because we know we have died 
We have realized our spiritual aspect from our physical aspect. When we do not look back at the moment of death from beyond death's gate, it is for our eye consciousness after death like the experience of sleep for our physical eye consciousness here on earth. Just as we know nothing of the physical eye consciousness during sleep, we know nothing of ourselves after death if we do not see this moment of dying. Seeing it is one of the most splendid, one of the most sublime moments. You see, even in this case, we must learn to think very differently here about the actual spiritual world than about the sensory physical world. If we comfortably stay only with concepts we have here in the physical sensory world, we cannot accurately grasp the spiritual at all, because the most important thing after death is that the moment of death is seen from the other side. Through looking at the moment of death, our eye consciousness is awakened on the other side. Here in the physical world, we have one side of eye consciousness. After death, we have the other side of eye consciousness. I described earlier where the suprasensory aspect of the physical body is after death, where we must search for it. We must search for this physical aspect, as much as we can sense it, as a relation of forces, an organism of forces, a cosmos of forces in the whole world. This physical aspect prepares for us the place through which we must pass between death and rebirth. Thus enclosed here by our skin in the physical body, in this small body, compared to the whole world, is really a microcosm, really an entire world. It is really just rolled up, if I may speak lightly, and then it unrolls and fills the world, with the exception of a small space that always remains empty. When we are living between death and rebirth, we are everywhere in the physical world with the suprasensory forces that formed the basis of our physical body, everywhere except the one particular place that remains empty. That is the place we take into ourselves here in the physical world within our skin, and that from the spiritual world we always look upon as empty. There we see ourselves from the outside and look into a hollowness. What we look into is empty. Because it remains empty, we have a basic feeling concerning it. This is not a detached looking, like when we stare at something here on the physical plane. Rather, this looking is connected to a powerful inner life experience. When we look at this void, a feeling arises that when, that then accompanies us throughout our whole life between death and rebirth, and which shapes much of what we call this otherworldly life. It is the feeling that there is something in the world that we must fill again and again, and that we attain the feeling that we have a reason for being in the world, a purpose that only we can fulfill. We sense our place in the world. We sense that we are a building block of the world without which the world could not exist. That is the vision of this void. When we look at this void, we are overcome by the fact that our belonging, of our belonging to the world. All of this is connected with what the physical body then becomes. From these elementary descriptions, we will be able to demonstrate only schematically, as it were, what really requires images for the reality in the spiritual world. But we must have these images first in order to gradually bring ourselves to concepts that penetrate further into the reality of the spiritual world. We know that we then experience after death a sort of memory that lasts for approximately three days. We use the word memory, even though strictly speaking it is not memory in the common sense. For a few days we experience something like a tableau, a panorama, which is woven from all that we have experienced in the previous life. But we do not have anything like an ordinary recollection within the physical body. 
A recollection in the physical body is such that we call it up chronologically from memory. Such memory is a force that is bound to the physical body, a thought in which we call up memories chronologically. The memory after death is such that everything that played out in life is around us, in our imagination, at the same time, as in a panorama. One can say that for days we live within this experience. Events that we have just experienced in the last period of time before our death are there simultaneously in powerful images, and also simultaneously what we experienced in childhood is there, a life panorama, a life image that shows us in a web woven of ether what happened during that time. Everything we see lives in the ether. Above all, we experience what is around us as alive. Everything is living and weaving. Then we experience it as spiritual sound, as spiritual light, and as spiritual warmth. This life tableau disappears after several days, as we know. But how does it end? And what is this life tableau? Indeed, when we investigate what this life tableau really is, we must realize that everything we experience in life is woven into it. But experienced how? By our thinking during life. Thus, everything that we experience conceptually or with thought is in the tableau. To give a specific example, let us say that you lived with someone during your life, that you spoke with that person. Through speaking, his thoughts were communicated to your thoughts. You received love from him. You let his whole soul affect you. You experienced all of this internally. When you live with other people, you witness their experiences. They live and we live. And we experience something of them. What we experience of a person is interwoven into this etheric life tableau. It is the same as what we remember. Imagine a moment when you experienced something with another person ten, twenty years ago. Imagine. Remember. After death, you will not remember as we usually remember in life, where everything fades. Rather, you will remember in such a way that the memory will be as alive in you as the experience itself. In the tableau, your friend will stand before you as at the time of the experience. In physical life, our experiences are often quite dreamlike. Strong experiences on the physical plane ease off and lose their strength. When we have gone through the gate of death and have an experience in the life tableau, it is not weakened. It is there with all the freshness and strength that was originally present during life. Thus the experience weaves into our life tableau. Thus we experience it ourselves for days. Just as, after death, we have the impression, in relation to the physical world, that our physical body has fallen away from us, so too do we have the impression, after some days, that our etheric body has fallen away from us. But this etheric body of ours actually has not fallen away in the same way that our physical body did. Rather, it is woven into the whole universe, the whole world. It is within the universe and makes impressions in it during the days we experience the life tableau. And what we have as a life tableau thus passes into the external world that lives around us. It is taken up into the world. During these days we will again have an important, vivid experience. This is because our experiences after death are not only experiences like the memories of earth life, rather they are building stones for absolutely new experiences. Here we come to our own, excuse me, how we come to our own I is itself a new experience in that we look back on our death. We cannot experience such a thing here with our earthly senses. This reveals itself only to initiated knowledge. But also, what we experience during those days when we have this life tableau around us, this etheric weaving that breaks away from us and weaves into the universe, what we experience then is also something exultingly sublime, 
something very powerful for the human soul. Here in physical life, indeed, we confront the world. We confront the mineral, plant, animal, and human kingdom. We experience what our senses can experience, whatever sense experiences the brain-bound intellect can have, what the mind connected to the vascular system can experience. We experience all of that here. And in fact, seen from a higher point of view, we humans here between birth and death are exceedingly large drips, in quotes, forgive the expression, giant drips. We are exceedingly ignorant in the face of the wisdom of the larger world if we think that what we experience here in the way described is all there is, and that in carrying in our memory what we have experienced, we think we have acquired it. We merely believe it to be so. But while we experience, while we create concepts and emotional perceptions during an experience, in our process of experiencing, the whole world of hierarchies work in this sequence. It lives and weaves within it. When we meet other people and look them in the eyes, the spirits of the hierarchies live in their gaze and in what their gaze transmits back to you. The work of the hierarchies lives in it. What we experience presents only the outer side to us. The gods work within the act of experiencing. And whereas we believe that we live only for ourselves, the gods are working something out through our experiencing until they have something that they can then weave into the world. We have conceived thoughts. We have had emotional experiences. The gods take them and share them with their world. And after we have died, we know that we have lived so that the gods can weave together what comes from our etheric body and give it over to the whole universe. The gods have allowed us to live so that, we, so that they can spin something for themselves with which they can enrich their world a bit. That is an earth-shaking idea. If you take only one step in the world, this step is the external expression of a God event and is a piece of the web that the gods will use in their world plan. When you go through the gate of death, they will take this step from you and incorporate it into the universe. Our strokes of destiny are also the deeds of gods. And what our lot is for us as human beings is only the outer side. This is what is meaningful, important, essential. And now, what we have gained internally in life by being able to think, by having emotional perceptions, to whom does this actually belong? After our death, it belongs to the world. As we look back on our death with what we now have remaining, with the astral body and the eye. We see what has been woven into the universe and the world. During physical life, we carry within us, as our etheric body, what is later woven into the universe. After death, it spins off and is interwoven into the physical world. We look at it, observe it. As we experience it inwardly, here in physical life, so do we look at it after death in the world outside of us. Just as we look at stars and mountains and rivers outside of us here, so too do we see after death, besides what becomes of the physical body as fast as lightning, what the world has taken into itself of our own experiences. And those of our own experiences that were incorporated into the whole world, constitution, are now reflected in what we have left in the astral body and I exactly as the outside world is reflected in our physical organs through our physical human body here. And as this is reflected in us, we receive something that we cannot have here during this earth existence, but we will have later during the Jupiter stage in the form of an external phys physical impression. It is something that we receive now in a spiritual way, because our etheric body is at this time 
outside of us and makes an impression on us. Instead of experiencing the etheric as we did earlier as our inner aspect, now it makes an impression on us from outside. The impression it makes is certainly first and foremost a spiritual one. It is pictorial. But as something pictorial, it is already a model for what we will have inwardly for the first time in the Jupiter stage, the spirit self. That is, through our etheric aspects being interwoven into the universe, the spirit self is born for us. But this is a spiritual model for the future and not an outer member, in quotes, of our being, just as we will have on Jupiter, such as we will have on Jupiter. So, after we have discarded the etheric body and we have our astral body, I, and spirit self, thus of our earthly existence now remain our astral body and our I. The astral body remains with us for a long time after death, as you know, just the same as when it was first of all subject to us as the earthly astral body. It remains with us because this astral body is pervaded by what is only earthly human, which the astral body cannot bring out of itself immediately. We go through a period during which we can finally cast off little by little what earthly life has made of our astral bodies. Here on earth we actually basically experience, at most, only half of our experiences, insofar as they touch the astral body. We really only experience, excuse me, we ex- really experience only half of what somehow takes place through us. Let us take an example. It is the same with good thoughts and good actions as it is with bad actions and bad thoughts. But let us take as an example this bad action. Imagine that you say something mean to a person who then feels hurt about it. You have only what concerns you from this mean thing you said. You have the feeling within yourself concerning the reason you made this remark, that is, the impression on your own soul when you said it. But the other person on whom you inflicted this mean remark has a very different impression. That person has the other half of the impression, so to speak the feeling of being hurt. This other half of the impression really lives on in the person. The one side is what you have experienced yourself here during physical life. The other side is what the other person has experienced. We must live through all of these experiences again after death by going through our own life backward. We live in reverse through the effects of our thoughts and actions. That is, during the life between death and rebirth, we experience our earthly life in reverse. When the etheric body separates from us and forms the life tableau in which our whole life is displayed simultaneously around us, we look upon it from outside. But this going backward through our life is truly a living through what we have done. When we have gone backward to the point of our last birth, we are then ready to discard the part of our astral body that was permeated with the earthly aspect. Then the astral body separates from us, and with this laying aside of the astral body, a new state of being begins. The astral body always keeps us connected with the earth through our experiences. When we must go through our astral body in this way, not dreaming, but reliving earthly experiences in reverse, We are still in earth life. We are still within it. When we have laid aside, in quotes, not the best words, but there is no other way to say it, because our language does not have a word for it, the astral body, we become completely free of the earthly aspect, and we begin to live in the actual spiritual world. And then a new experience begins. This laying aside of the astral body is really only one side of the experience. The other side is something quite different. When we have laid aside the astral body after going through our earthly experiences, then we feel as if internally permeated with, we cannot say matter, but as if with spirit. Then we really feel present in the spiritual world for the first time. The spiritual world dawns in us internally. 
before we were aware of it externally, when we saw the universe and our own etheric body interwoven in the universe. Now we realize it internally, now we experience it internally, and our own eye dawns in us internally as a pre-image for what human beings will have in physical expression first during the Venus stage of evolution. It is a pre-image or model of the life spirit. We now are made of spirit self, life spirit and I. Just as we might feel dreamlike here in physical life from birth to the moment that we really become conscious as a child, the moment to which we can later remember back, so too do we live an existence that, though it is completely self-aware, is more conscious and higher than earthly life. But we do not experience a completely spiritual life until we have separated from our astral aspect and have retained from it only what fulfills us inwardly. From this time on, we are spirit among spirits. But now another experience, an important and essential experience, begins. Here, when we work in physical life, we perform various actions, and with them we have experiences. Indeed, we have just spoken of this. But we have experiences not only in the physical world. We also have something else during the experiences, which is simultaneous with the experiences. And I want to use a particular word, even if it is only a very general expression for these simultaneous experiences. One could say we become weary while we experience, worn out. That is indeed always the case. We become weary. And even if this weariness is balanced out through sleep, much less through sleep than through the peace during sleep, it is still really only a partial balancing out, because as we know, of course, our forces dwindle little by little. We age. We also become tired in a general sense. And as we get older, we cannot compensate for everything through sleep. Thus here on earth we become worn out, tired. Indeed, after what has been said, we can now raise the question, why do the gods allow us to get tired? Why do we become tired? Becoming tired here, getting worn out, gives us something. It actually means a lot for our total life. It means ever so much. We must simply grasp the concept of becoming tired in a more comprehensive sense than we usually think of it. We must set it quite intensively before our souls, this concept of becoming tired. You will best understand the concept of becoming tired if you imagine the matter in this way. If I were to ask one of you right now if you experience something of the inside of your body, probably only those plagued with a headache would answer that they are experiencing something now, in this instant, about the inside of their body. Only they feel the inside of their body, the rest of us live without feeling it. We feel our organs only when they are not quite right. Then, by feeling, we know something about our organs. In life we are constructed in such a way that we know about our physical body only when it is not quite right. We really have only a general feeling for our physical body. It becomes stronger when something is not right. But we have only a feeling. We know very little internally. Those who have had intense headaches know about the inside of their head internally not as an anatomist does, who knows only the container. But when we become more and more tired in life, this feeling of our inside, our spatial internal, appears more and more in our body. Just think, the more we become weary in life, the more the infirmities of life appear. The infirmities of age, for example. Our lives consist of gradually sensing this physical aspect of ourselves, learning to feel it. As it hardens us, enters into us, we learn to feel it. Because it happens so gradually, it is a subtle feeling for us. We would know how intense it is if we, for example, forgive the simple expression, but it will express to you what I mean, could feel in one moment as sound as a bell, 
like a child bursting with health, and then immediately after for comparison, as one feels, when the limbs have become frail at 80 or 85 years old. Then we would immediately feel the contrast. But instead, it happens so slowly, we do not notice how we are spun into the exist experience of the physical, into becoming tired. Becoming tired is a real process. But actually it is not present at all at first, because the child is bursting with life. Then as life progresses, the life force is constantly drained by this becoming tired. Then the tendency to become tired predominates. We become tired. While we become tired in this way, even if it is, let us say, only a slight feeling from within us, something internal actually develops within us. Our life here in the physical world offers us only the external part of deep, significant, exalted secrets. Feeling, which is thus accompanied quietly in life by this process of becoming tired and of sensing the inside of our bodies, is the exterior of something that is woven within us, wonderfully woven from pure wisdom, a whole web of pure wisdom. By becoming tired in life, and learning to sense internally a fine knowledge of the wondrous structure of our internal organs is woven into us. We learn to become tired in our hearts, but becoming tired means that knowledge is woven into us, is constructed like a heart from the universe. We become tired in our stomachs. We make them tired primarily in, what, in that we ruin them through food. But even so, all wisdom, an image of wisdom from the cosmos, of the way the stomach is constructed, is woven into us as our stomachs become tired. The way our internal organism is constructed, sublime, wonderful. This formidable work of art forms an image that comes alive only when we have laid aside the external part of the astral body that was tied to the earth. And it is this image that fills us as life spirit and now lives in us. The wisdom about ourselves, about our wondrous internal structure, now lives in us. And so the time begins when we learn to compare, as it were, what now fills us from out of wisdom in the form of life spirit to what was woven into the universe earlier as etheric presence. Now we work on this comparison, on how one can fit with the other, and we create as an image a human being as it should be in the next incarnation. We begin in this way by gradually facing the cosmic midnight, as you will find indicated in the mystery drama titled The Soul's Awakening. Thus, after the cosmic midnight, we carry out a task, which takes place by participating in the creation of the world in bringing in what we enjoy here. During the life between death and birth, we work, we weave alongside the gods. We help weave part of the gods' images. We can be co-workers for the goals of the gods in that the gods put us in the world. We may prepare the next incarnation for ourselves. As we do so, not only processes that are egotistic in relation to us take place, but also all other possible processes. And this can arise from the following. Here on earth, winter changes to summer, the sun rises and sets. Everything that is earthly, work, takes place. In the spiritual world is a process that is much higher than that. What, at the very last, leads to our earthly incarnation? What leads to human existence? It is powerful heavenly work that has not only a meaning for us, but a meaning for the entire world. When we are able to gradually experience this wonderful process through spiritual sight, we encounter something astounding. It will indeed seem strange to you when I say it, but the higher secrets will always seem strange at first to our physical sensory way of seeing. What comes before our souls will shake us, the more the better. 
These things, as they are, should not come to our souls at all in such a way that we absorb them in a rational, dryly, cognitive way and thus remain indifferent. Precisely through these things, we should gain a soul impression of the grandeur and greatness of the divine spiritual world. One could say that were we to put spiritual science forward in a dry way that does not move the whole person and bring immediately an impression of the greatness and grandeur of what pulses and lives through the world as the divine spiritual aspect, then all of us would be born headless. For even after what I have just described, and in spite of everything that we are capable of, the way things are in the world today, we could not bring about the construction of our own head. The human head is such a sublime image or copy of the universe in its structure that human beings themselves cannot construct it. Even with our life's wisdom woven into us, we could not prepare it for the next incarnation. All of the hierarchies of the gods must play a part in it. What is present in your head, in this sphere, broken only by the occiput, occiput, this somewhat transformed sphere, is a real microcosm, a real impression of the great world globe. Everything that lives outside in the universe lives within it. Everything that is active in the various hierarchies works there. While we construct our next incarnation, from the wisdom collected as a result of our becoming tired as we aged, all the hierarchies influence this activity in order to incorporate into us what then becomes the head as an impression of all the wisdom of the gods. While all of this is taking place, our physical hereditary line is making itself ready through generations on earth. Exactly as we give over to the earth after death only what has come from the earth, so do we receive only the earthly part of ourselves from our parents and forebears. The earthly part of us is really only the external aspect, really only the external expression of this earthly aspect. Everything that we ourselves can first weave in the way described, and everything woven by the entire hierarchies of the gods, is woven into our heredity before we develop a relationship through conception to the physical body in which we envelop ourselves when we enter the physical plane. As I have said, the more that we take up this sublime awareness in our feeling life, the better it is for us. Just imagine, we use our head, but we generally have no idea at least to the extent that we are living with only a materialistic consciousness, that whole hierarchies of gods work to form our head, to form the spiritual basis for the head, so that we can exist at all. When we grasp this in the sense of spiritual scientific awareness, it permeates us of its own accord with sensations and feelings of gratitude to the whole universe. From this, What we approach through spiritual science should also produce an ever-increasing heightening of our feeling life. More and more in spiritual science, our feelings should keep up with our knowledge. It is not good for us to remain behind in our feelings. As we get to know spiritual science more deeply, we should be able to develop more reverence for the secrets of the world, which lead at last to the secrets of humanity. True progress in spiritual science lies in the purifying spiritual warmth of our sensations and our feelings. I must mention something else, because it seems to be an extension of this whole observation we have been making. We settle into the physical world first as a child, when we have a vague consciousness. At first we recognize our mother, and then get to know other people gradually. We think that as we settle into the physical world, We are always meeting new people, and that is the case for our physical consciousness. When we have passed through the gate of death, we have a true, real relationship to all those souls whom we had come near to in life on earth. They appear again before our spiritual gaze. We can say that we find those souls who came near to us in life, 
and who passed through death's gate before we did. The word, in quotes, find, is descriptive for physical relations. But we can also characterize this experience of souls coming near to other souls as finding. We must, though, imagine this finding of souls who have passed through the gate of death before us as coming near to them in the opposite way we approach people on the physical plane. Here we come near to people by first encountering them in an external physical way. Then we gradually get to know their inner aspect. Our experience of their inner aspect develops only from our, in quotes, settling into them. Thus, what we experience inwardly of a person develops only from our own inner aspect. After we ourselves have passed through the gate of death and encounter the souls who passed through the gate of death before us, then we first of all know that the soul in question is there. We sense the soul. We know it is there. But we must now give over our whole inner aspect to what is there as a first impression, a most abstract impression. Here in life on earth, we must allow people to affect us, After death, we must devote or give over our inner aspect and we must construct the image, the imagination, ourselves. The imaginative element, what we can see, we must construct for ourselves little by little. You can have an idea of this experience after death if you imagine that you do not see the other soul. Rather, you only perceive the other soul when... You create for yourself an image by comprehending the other soul's inner nature little by little. You construct an image for yourself. Thus, after death, you must actively construct inwardly the image of the souls that you encounter. You know in some way that you are now encountering a soul, but it does not yet have spiritual form. Which soul is it? That is the soul, this now surfaces in your own soul, to which I have had the feeling of a son to his mother. Now you begin to feel. I can experience myself with this soul. Now you construct the spiritual form. You must be active within it, and then it will become an image. And by having to construct the spiritual form together in this way, you are already with the other departed person, even before you have constructed the spiritual form. It is this way with everyone that you were with in earthly life. That is, you now experience them in a world in which you must find them by first awakening the ability to see them. You have to be active in this process. For those still here in the physical body, those who remain living after we have died, we have already encountered them here on earth as images. We look down on them from the spiritual world and do not need to construct an image. They look back at us as an image. They can then interweave something into this image that is like a warming spiritual sustenance for us through their thoughts about us through their memory of us, and, as we know it, as spiritual scientists, by reading aloud to us. All of this widens our view into the true world, into the really true world. When we let it come before our souls thus, we have an idea of how little human beings actually know of the spiritual world. It was not always this way. Only the most materialistic people of our time speak of how, quote, wonderfully far, close quote, we have come today. In fact, we know that human beings had clairvoyance in the past and that they lost this original clairvoyance, atavistic clairvoyance, for the sake of gaining certain characteristics that are connected with the experience of living entirely immersed in the material world. Truly materialistic people, completely materialistic scholars would say, of course, that it is fantasy to talk of an original clairvoyance, of people in the past knowing something special. But if people truly saw the world, even a bit, with their physical eyes, they would find the materialist claim already disproved. 
It was not all that long ago that people knew more than they do now. You know, we have often spoken of it, and I would like to mention it again here in closing, that Lucifer and Araman are part of the spiritual existence in which we live. We also know that Lucifer is symbolized in the Bible as a serpent, a serpent in a tree. The physical serpent, as we experience it today, and as an artist in painting paradise would surely paint it today, this physical serpent is not the true Lucifer. Rather, it is the outer reflection, the physical reflection. The true Lucifer is a being that stayed behind during the moon stage of evolution. He cannot be seen on earth among physical objects. Thus, if an artist wishes to paint Lucifer, this would have to be done through a sort of clairvoyant inner sight, so that Lucifer could be comprehended as an etheric form. And Lucifer would then appear as he himself works on us, how he plays no part in our head or our organism, insofar as he is purely out of the earth, but in the continuation of the head down through the spinal cord. Lucifer must be painted this way if one is to paint him, according to his etheric form, with a human head and a snake-like continuation in the human spinal cord. And thus, an artist who knows something of spiritual science would have to paint for us Adam and Eve, the tree, and up above in the tree the serpent, that is, the serpent only as an expression, with a human head on top. If an artist painted something like this today, we would accept that it was painted from spiritual science, of course. In the art gallery in Hamburg, there is a painting from the Middle Ages by Meister Bertram that depicts this scene in paradise in this way. In this painting, the serpent is in the tree, as I just described it, painted correctly. You can see the picture there. People today, however, do not go about in the world with their eyes open, but blindfolded. It has also been painted this way by other artists. Perhaps there is something similar in Leipzig. What follows from this? People in the Middle Ages knew about this, knew it to the degree that they even painted it. This means it was not so long ago that people were first forced entirely onto the physical plane. And what informs us today from the material world as the course of the spiritual history of humanity is essentially nothing more than an outright lie. One is led to believe that human beings have always been the way they have become in the last few centuries, whereas it was really not so long ago that they saw into the spiritual world with clairvoyance. But they had to abandon this ability to see the spiritual world, because they were not free. In order to obtain full freedom and eye consciousness, it was necessary to give up this sight. And now we must find our way again into the spiritual world. Hence, spiritual science prepares something important, something essential, this living into the spiritual world again. And we should bring before our souls again and again the necessity that there are a handful of people who live today in the material world and are led by their karma to take on the most important tasks of humanity for the future. We perceive that these people have through their soul life to perform most important things. Without being arrogant, we must show in all humility and modesty how great the difference is between a soul that is trying to find its way gradually into the spiritual world and all of the others today who have no idea and who have no desire to have any idea of the spiritual. We must not simply, excuse me, it must not become simply a deplorable, painful feeling for us Rather, it must be a feeling that motivates us to continue working, that motivates us to be true to our work in the stream of spiritual science to which we have been led by our karma, our fate. At our last gathering here, I also mentioned that when people pass through the gate of death, before having completely lived out their life, what was given to them as etheric body force is not yet completely used up. If a person passes through the gate of death at a young age, the etheric body could have affected the physical body for decades to come. This force is not lost. Rather, it is still there. 
I have also already mentioned that because death daily and hourly approaches humanity in such great numbers at present, many etheric bodies that could have supported physical bodies for a longer time in the physical plane are consigned to the spiritual etheric world and continue to hover. And these forces, which could have taken care of the physical body for decades more, become spiritual forces that participate in the spiritual evolution of humanity. Thus a time will come in which the forces within these etheric bodies can be used for the spiritual advancement of humanity. This will come about only if, after today's terrible events have gone from this earth and peace has arrived once again, the souls here on earth, who still move on this earth in physical bodies, are able to understand that all those who entered the spiritual world in the past have their etheric bodies there and can radiate their forces into evolution. This must be understood by the souls here on earth, and these souls will be able to participate in this spiritual advancement, which is possible for the future, precisely because of so many sacrificial deaths. Think what it would mean if spiritual science were to disappear now and no one understood all that is being prepared in the spiritual world through their sacrificial death. The entire sum of these forces would fall to spiritual beings that would use them for a purpose other than what they should be used for, according to the resolve of the rightful further developing gods. This possibility, however, admonishes us even from the events of our time, to be fully present with our consciousness to everything that the spiritual world is, because these current events too have a spiritual side. What is present outwardly in blood and death and casualties is the external expression of inner spiritual events, which must, however, be understood in the correct sense. This is what I want to remind you of again and again with the closing words of our reflections today. From the combatant's courage, from the blood of battle, from the suffering of those abandoned, from the people's sacrificial death, spiritual fruit will grow. May souls guide their senses, conscious of spirit, into the realm of the spirits. Mm -hmm.